How y'all doing? All right. Well, I'm glad to be here. Uh, this message originally was I gave two months ago out of the store campus. It's just taken a while to kind of funnel down over here. But uh, as you can see, uh, the title of it is How Then Shall We Live? And really, it, it was really crafted about what we've been walking through the last six months. And I recall a conversation that I had. Um, I'm going to read the scripture in just a minute. Uh, I recall a conversation I had just uh, maybe four months ago when I was talking about how I had been to the uh, the conference, the Passion Conference in Atlanta, Georgia, where I was with 70,000 young people. I was probably the oldest person there. And as we ushered in the new year, and I remember thinking as we ushered into 2020, wow, this is going to be a year that we're never going to forget. <laughs> but I saw it very differently than how it's turned out. Which brings us to the passage this morning, Romans 5, which says, we also have joy with our troubles, because we know that these troubles produces perseverance, and perseverance, character, and character, hope. And this hope will never disappoint us, because God has poured out his love to fill our hearts. He gave us his love through the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to us. This is the word of the Lord. So in light of what I was talking about, how different this year has turned out, what I really thought, uh, I, I don't know about you, but I find myself longing uh, to get back to the past, how it was a year ago. Have you felt that? Uh, and what I, even more kind of bizarre, is what I thought was the mundane, things I didn't even notice, I found myself longing for, sitting in coffee shops with people, uh, checking sports scores, giving people hugs, uh, and even to the point that I'm missing daily annoyances. Like I never thought I would long to be in a movie theater waiting for 20 minutes of previews to get to the movie, right? Uh, and more importantly, obviously, just because of my vocation, my calling, is talking with so many people over the last several months who are dealing with real, real devastation. It's a new normal for all of us specifically for people that live alone or people that find themselves really almost, they're really struggling with their mental health uh, because we, God made us to be with each other. He long, we long for human touch. We, have, we are being devastated by people we're losing. We can't even hold uh, proper funerals for people. As I was telling the service over there just a little while ago, some of you may know this, but my father died on Tuesday. Uh, and he's been fighting pancreatic cancer for three years. Uh, and when I talked to him a few weeks ago, he seemed anxious, and he's never, ever anxious. And I said, Dad, what are you anxious about? Are you worried about dying? He said, I've never been scared of dying, never. What I am worried about, though, is that I don't want to get COVID, and I don't want to die in a hospital alone. And I told him, um, we will never, ever let that happen, Dad. He did get COVID, and he did die in a hospital alone. And I, I have to deal with that. But I realized through this process that what I'm dealing with, what millions and millions of people around the world are dealing with, and what all of us in New are dealing with, this is, none of this is what we expected. And what I know now is we miss connection. Do we not? And the ability to be able to rejoice with those who rejoice and to laugh when those who laugh, to uh, celebrate with those who celebrate and to cry with those that, that cry. We miss what we once had. And the, the fact of the matter is, I think I'm kind of coming to realize this from a spiritual standpoint, we seem to always miss what we once had. And this is the reason why it's dawned on me the last year, uh, trying to recapture what we once had is big business in America. And this is the reason why, by the way, all the new baseball stadiums they're building now, they all look 80 years old. Why is that? They're trying, to, they're trying to recapture the yesteryear, how we think it once was. This is the reason why we take pictures at graduations, at weddings, at family vacations, and we yearn for a recreated, cleaned up past that we once had. 
And there's a reason why I think this. And the reason why we feel this more than ever is because we are living right now in such dysfunction right now, a longing for simpler times comes very, very easily. It, it's just something that comes natural. But here's what I want to go with this, because this can lead us astray. And let me give you a biblical example of this. Probably the, maybe the greatest example of this in the Old Testament, really in the Bible, is when the Israelites were freed from the Egyptians after 400 years in bondage. And they were led out of slavery into eventually one day it was going to be the promised land. They, were, they spent time in the wilderness. And during that time, God gave them commandments. And they swore an oath to God. And they said to God, they said to God, we are going to uphold these commandments. We are not going to have any other gods. We are not going to have any graven images. We are not going to have any idols. And so they give an oath that they're going to do this. And then Moses leaves, goes up, goes up to Mount Sinai. And they don't know if or when he's ever going to return. And what begins to happen was they begin to wander around the wilderness. They found themselves in a season of wilderness. Hmm? Not knowing what was coming next. And they begin to question, where's God? Why is allowing this to happen to us? What's going to happen in the future? Why can we not get back to what we once had in the past? And it reminded me of a quote that I, for years I used to quote to people, and now I no longer quote it anymore, but this is the quote, because it's a very bumper sticker theological saying, and that is, never question in the dark what God has told you in the light. Sounds very good, sounds very preachy, okay? But the problem is, I'm having the hardest time pulling that off. But of course you question in the dark what God's told you in the light because you're walking around the dark. You, you can't make sense of things. You're, we're in the wilderness, which is where we find ourselves right now. And this, this is exactly where the Israelites found themselves. They were wandering in the desert. They were wandering around the wilderness. They were hungry and they wonder where Moses was, and they begin to question. And they begin to ask questions about where's God. And the, now here's the, 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 the question I want to bring to you. Did they suddenly stop believing in God? Uh, no, they didn't. They believed in God. I mean, they had, they had seen the miracles. They had seen the, the plagues that came through that devastated Pharaoh. They saw God part the Red Sea. They even saw when they were going hungry, God provided for them manna from heaven for them to eat. They saw that. They saw God's power. But I believe their wandering in the wilderness gives a, is a deeper explanation that I think all of us can have some connective tissue here this morning. And what do I mean by that? Well, they just come out of a spiritual high of crossing the Red Sea. Imagine seeing something like that. And you get through and all the bad guys <laughs> don't get through. And they come through this incredible spiritual high, and then suddenly they find themselves in a season of wilderness wandering around. And they found themselves, as they were eating this manna, which probably didn't taste very good, but it sustained them, they, they began to long for what they once had. Sound familiar? They long for bread. They long for meat. They long for fish. They long for the leeks, for the onions, for the garlic. And I would say to you, that longing, that yearning they had for the food, there is something deeper going on here than just food. And that is they long for the stable. They long for stability, for roots, for predictable rhythms they had known for years and years and for decades they had known. And they longed for that. They wanted that back. And the yearning consumed them to the point that they had lost sight of what God had delivered them from and what God was taking them to. They lost sight of that. So when Moses disappeared, they began to kind of recreate a former life uh, through feasting, through celebration, through religious customs, to the point where they began to fashion a golden calf of how they wanted to see God. Now, we may not form a golden calf, but we do form idols. Uh, and the reason why is when we lose our old world and... The, the new world is something completely different than what we're used to, and we're in the wilderness of uncertainty, there is a temptation to kind of reach back and grab through our nostalgia to try to recreate 
a past that really wasn't true? Or we kind of airbrush it to make it better than it was. Now, the question is, how can something so seemingly harmless as nostalgia spirit, you know, spiritually paralyze us? And, of course, the best illustration I can give is through C.S. Lewis. Okay? He wrote, I think, one of the greatest books in history called The Screwtape Letters. A lot of people are confused by the book. So let me explain it this way. And love the story of this. Okay, let me give some background. Lewis was sitting in church on a Sunday morning at the 8 o'clock service, Church of England. <laughs> this is so funny. And he began to do what we all do in the middle of the service. He began to kind of fade out in the middle of the service. Don't act like you know what I'm talking about, okay? I know you do. I can see some of your faces sometimes, okay? He begins to fade out, kind of daydream, and he begins to imagine what would it be like if a senior devil was writing letters to a junior devil about how to bring down a Christian? Someone who's newly become a Christian, how would we destroy their faith? And how will we get them not to focus on God, but to focus on anything else but Christ? And so Lewis imagines this, and he goes home from church that day, and he begins to write down these letters, that the, a, imagining what a senior devil would write to a junior devil about how to bring down a Christian. It is one of the greatest books in history. And what Lewis observed, I think, had to be from God. Because basically what the senior devil says to the junior, junior devil is God wants his people to focus on two things. He wants us to keep our eyes on eternity, and eternity will affect how we live in the present. So, in other words, we have two feet planted in this world while always keeping our eyes on that heavenly city. Because eternity will change how we live in our present circumstances. What Lewis says is, what the devil wants to do is, he wants to make sure we do not focus on either of those two things. So we will spend an inordinate amount of time either really, really worried, wringing our hands, worried about what could happen in the future, what we could lose if we lose our money or this person gets elected or, or this happens. We're just so worried. Or we look back on the past, this yearning, this nostalgia to get back what we once had. Either of these cases, what the devil says is, I'm equally pleased either of those because it keeps us from focusing on eternity and it keeps us from focusing on the present where God has us. So it just withdraws God's people out of society. And one of sin's defining qualities is to disconnect our connection to the present. And boy, is this a sign and a message for these times we have in right now. We obsess about the future or we obsess about what we once had. And this is what the senior devil says. The task is to keep the Christian so occupied with himself and his own worries that he is unable to concentrate where God has him. Jesus wants men to be concerned about what they do. Our business, the senior devil says, is to keep them thinking about what could happen or what they lost. See, and here's the danger. Okay, nostalgia may feel very pleasant. It may, it may renew us, uh, but it's, let me, let, me, let me give this illustration. It, is a, it, it may appear harmless, but it is, a, it is an odorless carbon monoxide that can kill us, that can strangle us. And it can be devastating to removing God's people from long stretches of time where God wants us to be. Now, let me say here, I don't think nostalgia is necessarily a bad thing. I mean, it can be a great thing for us to look back and see what God has done and, and remember God's faithfulness. It refreshes us. It renews us. It does not become a bad thing until we make it an ultimate thing. When you take a good thing, you make it an ultimate thing like an idol. It then becomes a bad thing because it then controls you. And unbridled nostalgia causes us to cling to golden calves. They may not be something we make, but something, an idea that reminds us of a past rather than recognizing the pillars of clouds by day and the fire by night in the present circumstances where God has us in the wilderness. We just do not see it. I mean, think about it. Uh, Lot's wife, remember she was turned into a pillar of salt? Do you remember Why? She was looking back. 
She didn't like that she had to leave. She, didn't like, she wanted to have what she once had. She looked back. And spiritually speaking, we idolize this. We do this all the time. And let me give you a couple examples of this, how we recreate a past that really wasn't true and think it was great then. Let me give you two examples. I spent my summers growing up in Kitty Hawk, North Carolina. I realize many of you might not know what that is, but I believe my family owned a timeshare, so we spent you know, a month or two every summer in Kitty Hawk. I was running up and down Jockey's Ridge, the place where the Wright brothers learned first flew their planes. And to me, that cottage we were in was the greatest place on earth. I mean, it was just heaven. And as I got older, and we never went back there, as I got older, I began to look back on that and say, one day, I'm going to get enough money, and I'm going to go back and rebuy that cottage where my children can go to and my grandchildren can go to. So a few years ago, I, I finally took Lisa back to this cottage, and we rolled up to it, and that place was an absolute dump. <laughs> I mean... And she said, is that, how, is that how it is? I go, yeah, but I don't remember it like that. It's exactly the place it was. But I, you know, airbrushed it, my memory, till it was greater than it was. Or let me give another example, examples of this. And this is real time. And man, if I could get a dollar for every time I've heard this during this last year, I could retire early, okay? And that is this. This is what I've heard, okay? I've heard this so much. I've never seen this bad in this country. This is the worst it's ever been. These young people today, there's nothing like this. We've got to get to back how it used to be. And when it was great, okay, now I'll talk to you after the service, okay? Because, <laughs> because, here, because here's what I asked. I, someone a few months ago said this to me. I wish we could get back to how it used to be. And I finally said, what are you talking about, man? You keep saying, what, what are you talking about? What age? And he finally said, uh, he, he looked surprised, and he said, uh, the 1980s, that was when we were great. And I laughed. I did not mean to laugh in front of him, but I laughed because I specifically remember the only time I ever saw my grandparents argue. When I was growing up, it was in, in the mid-80s. And I remember my grandparents in Fayetteville, North Carolina, in their kitchen, my grandfather, who was a World War II vet, saying, he was saying, I've never seen this bad in this country. This is the worst it's ever been. These young people today are horrible. We need to get back how it used to be in the 1950s. That was when it was great, when we came out of that war. That was when we were great. And I realized, I heard my grandmother say, referring back to her, what her parents said in the 1950s, they wanted to get back to the 1920s, because that was when it was, life was really true. And what I realized is every generation says this, because I grew up in the 80s. And it wasn't as great as we think it is. We always airbrush the past and make it better than it is. And this is the point that the devil wants us to do. Instead of be focused on the present, we lose ourselves, either worried about what could happen or constantly looking back. And what I need to say, what I just need to say, I need to put the skunk on the table this morning and say something. And it is hard as it is for you to hear, it's even harder for me to say this. But to keep this from spiritually paralyzing us, this is what you need to know, okay? Our life that we had pre-2020 is gone. And we are not getting it back. It's hard for me to say that. But it is gone. And I also need to say this, okay? And you need to hear this. There is no economic miracle. There is no executive decision that can give back what we need. Only Christ can do that. Okay? And the politicians and congressmen, they cannot give back lives. They cannot give back memories. They cannot give back what we've lost, our rhythms, our routines. And I know this because I'm living this, facing this kind of reality. It stirs up grief, and we need to acknowledge this. I, I do not want to over-spiritualize this. I think all of us are dealing with collective loss. I mean, the fact that, you know, my father died in a COVID unit alone, I will never get over that. But I know, I do know, okay, that Christ will redeem it. And he will restore what the locusts have eaten. I believe that. I absolutely believe that. Okay, 
Thank you, Mom and Dad. I appreciate that, okay? What I want you to know is Christ can transfigure and redeem what may appear to be irretrievable loss. And he can do it in ways we did not believe were possible. I'm seeing it. And Lewis emphasizes this in the screw tape letters. He does. And he challenges us. I want to put this quote up in here. This is the devil saying what he does not want to happen. Okay, let me put this quote up here. Obeying the present voice of Christ, bearing the present cross, receiving the present grace, giving thanks for the present blessings. And let me say a few words about this, okay? This first part, okay? Bearing the present cross. This is just a reality. And that is, there is probably not a person in here who's not bearing a cross. And let me remind you again, as I'm reminding people all the time, because I hear it all the time, the Bible does not say that God will never give you more than you can handle. That ain't in the Bible. And it's not true. And the point of it is, when we are bearing a cross, it points us to Christ. It points us to Jesus. And it makes us more, the suffering makes us more like him. And by the way, the idea of the cross, the whole image is resurrection is coming. Okay. But it brings us to the second point I think is just as important here that Lewis writes about. It's about receiving the present grace, giving thanks for the present blessings. Now, it is a lot harder to see the blessings. But what I'm saying to you is they are all around us if we look for them right now. What is happening now in our country the last six months was not happening before that, at least from my vantage point. And it's huge. It's huge because as we are wandering around in the wilderness, there are the blessings that are to be had. God is opening doors, and praise God, we need the courage to walk through them. And if you don't know what doors, you need to pray that God opens them up because they are all over the place. I mean, I have, uh, the last six months, I have rekindled friendships that I did not have, you know, six months ago. I didn't even know what Zoom even was a year ago. And I'm talking to old track mates. I'm talking to old uh, friends I had 20 years ago. I'm having spiritual conversations because I know I'm a minister. Uh, I'm having walks with my wife. I'm talking to my neighbors who I never even met that live just a few doors down from me. Am I the only one here? I mean, uh, it's leading to larger conversations. We have a new appreciation, do we not, for those who are working in grocery stores? We, we have absolutely have a new appreciation for teachers. Now, I've often argued for teachers, but they've just been forgotten. Not anymore. I mean, every parent who's had to have their children home all year knows what this is about. Uh, we have appreciation for mail carriers. We have appreciation for those in the medical profession, in the hospitals. That nurse has sat with my dad. There will they'll, they'll never come an end to the thanks that I feel that, that she was in the room. So he wasn't completely alone. Uh, time I'm sitting with my children, the board games I'm playing, honestly, if I never have to play Monopoly again, I'm good with that, okay? <laughs> uh, playing Uno. Uh, I, I'm appreciating life that I had not appreciate before. Uh, we're cooking, we're eating dinner together, we are getting rid of stuff that I've been wanting to get rid of for 30 years, okay? And what I'm saying to you is the present pleasures will vary from person to person, but I'm saying to you this is very much the manna that God has given us as we are walking through this season of, in the season of wilderness. And it, in times like these, communities of faith can offer something that no politician, no community Nobody else can offer, we can offer something that nobody else has, and that's hope. Hope that is found in the gospel. Hope that is found in Jesus Christ. Hope in a full biblical sense. I know this now, and many of you know this, but hope is born out of hardship. And our word says it. We have this joy that comes from our troubles because we know that these troubles produces a perseverance. And perseverance produces character. And what does character produce? It produces hope. And this is what Paul says, okay? And this hope, praise God, will never, never disappoint us. Because God has poured out his love, his love inside of here. And he gave us this love through the Holy Spirit whom God has given to us. 
We have something that will last through the ages. And hope takes root when people of God follow the Spirit and it gives us courage to face the present trials we now find ourselves in. So our comfortable American life, I see, see it's given away to a season of wandering in the wilderness and the things we were once dependent upon are no longer there. But what I'm saying to you is the manna that God is providing, certainly in my life, and I know this is true of many of you, the manna that God is providing for us, it may be different than what we've had before, but it is enough. It's enough. And it nourishes us in ways that the past could never do. And so as our current crisis carries on, we are going to have the temptation, I cannot stress this enough, to either be worried about what's going to happen in the future or constantly trying to recapture what we had in the past. And what I'm saying to you is we've got to be fully involved where God has us right now. We cannot lose sight of that. So we have two feet planted firmly in this world while we are looking our eyes to that heavenly city. Because what I'm saying to you is um, when we have, when we know what our future holds in eternity, we are not scared. Nothing can shake us. And it directly impacts our present circumstances because where the Spirit is, there is freedom. And where there's freedom, God is making all things new. And so it is with you. Let's pray. Our Lord, as we find ourselves wandering in this season of wilderness, help us to once again to hear your voice. Because each of us here, Lord, are carrying crosses. Some, it just seems overwhelming. And though we walk through a valley, of sh and though we walk through a, though we walk through a season when we find ourselves in the wilderness, we once again remember, Lord, the echoes that David said ages ago, that surely your goodness and mercy shall follow us all the days of our lives. As we look forward to that day, we dwell in your house with you forever. It's in that name we ask and pray these things. Amen.